announcements too. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Metro Vision Idea Exchange on Green from the Ground Up, uh, the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. My name is Kate Hale. I'm assistant planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, we're joined today by Alyssa Bogan, Jonathan Watchdell, Christy Cerrone, and Kayla Besselt, who will be giving us an overview of the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program, some of the successes in communities who have adopted the program, and for those interested, information on how to get a program started in your own community. Here is our agenda for this session. Um, I'll hand it off shortly to our speakers and um, we'll try to hold plenty of time at the end for a live Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Dr. Cog website for later viewing. Um, there, and there will also be a brief survey that appears upon exiting the webinar. Um, and we just ask that you consider taking a couple minutes to respond to that. Um, that helps inform our programming for these idea exchanges um, and anything that you guys would like to see. Um, in future sessions. I wanted to direct your attention to the location of the Q&A box within the Zoom control panel. You can use this um, at any time to submit a question for the speakers um, throughout the presentations. Uh, these questions will be collected and addressed during the Q&A uh, portion at the conclusion of today's presentations. Um, if you're experiencing audio or other technical issues, you can also use this uh, Q&A box um, tool and just let us know and we'll do our best to help you troubleshoot. AICP credit is in the approval process for attendees uh, listening to this session live. The event number for this webinar will be available when it has been approved through APA. We're gonna kick off with some live polling today to get a feel for um, who's in the room, um, and for that, we'll be using an application called Mentimeter. So the instructions to access that are on the screen now. Um, you can just go to this website, uh, menti.com in a browser or on your smartphone um, and enter the code when prompted. Um, you can also use a QR code if you have that um, on your phone. I'll give you all just a second to get that up and going. Um, if you miss that instruction pane, the instruction, the code is just up on the, on the top of this screen as well. Um, so this is our first question. Um, great, looks like people have figured it out. Uh, what is the main reason you are attending today's session? Um, it's a little hard to read on this screen. Hopefully it's more legible um on in the browser window but the options here are, are you looking for more information on neighborhood engagement program um, are you interested in the sustainable neighborhoods program but need more information um, or is your community very interested in joining the program um, in the next year or two um, and then if none of those quite describe you there's another option looks like a lot of people are interested in um, sort of general information on neighborhood engagement programs. Um, so that's good to know. Looks like we've gotten the majority of responses in here. So I'm gonna move on to the next question. And for those that said other, um, if you wanna enter your um, thoughts into the Q&A pane, um, I would be interested in what brought you here today. Next poll question, um, which of the following best describes you? Are you an elected official, city, town staff, um, or maybe there are some residents on today who are interested in bringing this um, program to your community? And again, Kate, it'd be great if the people that are putting other could put into the Q&A um, kind of where they're coming from or um, that would be helpful. Yeah, please do. Okay, yeah, we, I don't believe there's a, uh, a chat box function. So any sort of like comment on these things, um, if you wanna put them in the chat 
in the Q&A box. Um, that's probably the best way for us to see it on our end. Our third and final question, what sentence best re represents resident involvement in sustainability work and climate action in your community? Um, so I'll give you guys a minute to read through these options um, and select the one that best describes um, your situation. And for this one, you can select multiple options. pretty wide range here. So I'll just wait a few more minutes. Yep. Some responses still coming in. Okay, pretty, pretty much across the board. Um, that's good context to have. I am going to um, introduce our speakers now. Um, we have two representatives from the Sustainable Neighborhood ne um, Network on with us today. Um, Alyssa Vogan, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right. Um, uh, Alyssa received her Master in Environmental Management from Western Colorado University um, and is dedicated to exhibiting the necessity of localized action to help address the global climate crisis. She led the effort to form the Sustainable Neighborhood Network as a nonprofit in early 2020 and continues to support the SNN in many ways, including membership expansion, grant writing and fundraising and resource development. On um, a personal note, Alyssa likes to spend her free time on hiking trails with her rescue Doberman Moose. I used to have a dog named Moose. It's a good name. Um, before I hand over the controls to Alyssa, um, I just wanted to know we also have Jonathan watched online. And again, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, Jonathan is the creator of the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program, um, and he'll be joining us for the Q&A panel at the end. So um, that will be good um, insight to have. So if you have any questions um, specifically for Jonathan, um, just wanted to note that he'll be um, he'll be joining us in a um, more uh, later on in the programming today. Okay, Alyssa, I'm going to hand over the controls to you. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As Kate said, my name is Alyssa Vogan, and I currently serve as the director of the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. Um, and as she also mentioned, we officially became a nonprofit in May of last year. So um, I appreciate everyone taking some time to fill out the poll. It, um, understanding kind of who's, who's joining us today lets us know more about the type of information that we should be sharing throughout the presentation. Um, so it looks like most of you are joining us as um, staff members or maybe representing um, local health, public health organizations or nonprofits. Um, but whatever capacity that you're joining us in today, I'd like to just start off with having you think about a few questions as we share more about sustainable neighborhoods today. Um, so a few of the, those questions are, how do municipalities and counties leverage residents' skills and expertise to problem solve? So whether that's sustainability related or not, kind of think about how that's happening in your community. How do Dr. Cog members um, and beyond, since I don't think everyone here is necessarily a Dr. Cog member, um, address unique needs of neighborhoods? And what is the nature of you know, cities and counties' relationships with their neighborhoods? What tools exist to catalyze participation in existing local and regional sustainability programs? And how can Dr. Cog members, and again, beyond that, other communities, um, safely test new ideas while advancing community goals and plans? All right. So the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program was created in 2012 in Lakewood. Um, and at the time, Jonathan Wachtel, who um, is joining us for the Q&A later, as Kate mentioned, uh, was a neighborhood planner for the city of Lakewood. So while engaging with residents in neighborhoods, Jonathan um, recognized that the advancement of sustainability was becoming a priority for many residents. Um, and also that 
many of the residents were the ones that had the knowledge and expertise to help solve some of these complex um, problems in their communities specifically. They, the residents are also, were also often the ones that had the passion and the drive and really the willingness um, needed to test new and innovative ideas in their community. Uh, so the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program provides communities with the framework to go beyond kind of that typical resident engagement that we see in our climate action and sustainability planning processes or um, on advisory boards and actually allows the res residents to really drive the change on the ground in their neighborhoods. So following the program success in Lakewood, there were several other municipalities that began to inquire about bringing the program to their community. So since 2013, the program has been since been adopted by three other cities who have customized it to really meet, um, meet their own needs when it comes to climate action and sustainability goals. And um, again, specifically to the needs of their neighborhoods. The Sustainable Neighborhood Network is the umbrella organization. So you'll hear Sustainable Neighborhood Network and Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. So Sustainable Neighborhoods Network is the umbrella organization of all the communities that are participating in the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. Um, and so those communities are considered members of the network. And our organization also has eight board members whose experience range from private, nonprofit, and government work. And all of our presenters today are actually uh, also board members of the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. Looking high level at the impact of the network over nine years, uh, these four cities have engaged over 38,000 residents in across 30 neighborhoods. Um, and we really look forward to expanding that impact even further with new members. So to give you an idea of what this program is actually looking like on the ground in these cities, I'm going to hand it over to Christy Cerrone um, to share some of the work that's happening in Lakewood. Christy began as uh, the City of Lakewood Sustainable Neighborhoods Program Coordinator in April of this year, and she first got involved in the Sustainable Neighborhoods eight years ago as a volunteer in her own Lakewood neighborhood, uh, which is called Southern Gables. And for the past several years, she's helped out a few hours a week um, in Lakewood Sustainability Division before stepping into the coordinator role this spring. She develops resources and supports the neighborhoods, and she also finds really awesome and engaging and cool ways um, to get involved with the kids in Lakewood as well. So take it away, Christy. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah. Whoops, I think I'll wait for the slides to come back up. So I'll be sharing some information about um, a few of the a few examples of um, initiatives that have happened specifically in Lakewood and all of the cities that are participants have um, have tons and tons of examples too. I don't seem to be able to switch to the next slide, Kate. <clears throat> Okay, um, let's try this again. If you wanna try jiggling your mouse just a bit. Doesn't seem to, well, now it's up, I think. Okay, is that, there I am. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a, just a few examples of things that are happening here in Lakewood. Um, one is, and I guess before I start, I'll say that um, the, the city doesn't tell any of the neighborhoods what to do. The way it works actually is that neighborhoods, um, individual volunteers in each of the sustainable neighborhoods bring ideas that they are passionate about or see a need or a concern. They bring that forward to their sustainable neighborhood and then plan those initiatives and activities and events around those things. So one need that popped up was that um, neighbors um, <clears throat> looked at all of the big black garbage bags full of leaves piling up on everyone's driveways in the fall and said, we need to send these for composting instead of to the landfill. And so several of our neighborhoods have developed neighborhood leaf composting and collection programs. Um, another neighborhood um, was really interested in um, protecting and um, uh, replacing 
very old and dying trees in their neighborhoods and set up a, an initiative to plant 200 trees over two years. And they met this goal and are continuing forward with planting even more trees in their neighborhood. Um, several of our neighborhoods have had paint recycling events over the past several years and um, have had big success with that. I think everybody's basements and closets are full of unused paint. And so we've provided opportunities for people to uh, recycle that paint. And in fact, we had our first um, citywide and actually network wide um, paint recycling event a couple weekends ago with um, the Sustainable Neighborhood Network, Lakewood and Reet Ridge. Wheat Ridge participating together. And in the three locations that we had set up across those neighborhoods, we collected um, 98,266 pounds of paint, equivalent of 9,827 gallons of paint to be recycled. And we also um, collected optional cash donations from all of the people who brought their paint and collected $3,392 as a fundraiser to benefit the Sustainable Neighborhood Network and the neighborhoods that participated. Let's see, um, we've had neighbors um, in the, the top left corner picture, we had two neighbors who found out that um, things weren't getting recycled in the schools in their neighborhood. And so they went into the school and set up a lunchroom recycling program that they have, um, that took off and was very successful at their school and now has expanded to six other schools in their neighborhood. And they've even trained and taught other neighborhood volunteers in, in other sustainable neighborhoods how to do, um, how to implement this program in their schools too. So it's expanding um, even beyond their original neighborhood. Some of our neighborhoods have done um, community coat drives and other fundraisers. And this kind of gets it a little bit of the, um, the social sustainability part of sustainability is providing support and resources for people who need help in neighborhoods and in our communities. Uh, we've had a lot of neighborhoods do um, energy and water related programs with energy and water conservation, energy audits. Um, we have an energy bike here um, from one of our workshops. <clears throat> and we've had, speaking of workshops, there's lots and lots of different topics that have been, been addressed through workshops, um, chicken keeping, recycling tours, bike maintenance and care, um, you name the topic, we've, we've had neighborhoods that have brought those forward and addressed them. Um, in Lakewood, we have six neighborhoods who have community gardens that were either started by volunteers in the sustainable neighborhoods or are um, maintained or um, helped coordinate um, with sustainable neighborhoods. And um, another way that people engage to their neighbors is through clubs. And so we have walking and biking and running clubs. We have um, luncheon clubs. So anytime that people, um, we've had book clubs, people just gather around a shared interest. And um, that's another way, Alyssa will talk a little bit later about um, earning credits, but clubs are another way to earn some credits for participation in the program. Um, another benefit for neighbors and for um, communities is for um, to kind of have a, a, a pool of people who are interested in engaging in um, helping with city plans and other processes and getting feedback as um, cities move forward um, with um, sustainability plans or other types of city plans. Um, we have a, another way that neighborhoods have worked across neighborhoods um, is through our Be Safe program. One neighborhood started a Be Safe program and then it has expanded to nine of the neighborhoods in Lakewood. And um, the idea is that residents sign a pledge not to use harmful pesticides in their landscapes. And um, it's becoming, uh, then they get a yard sign that they put in their yard. So it becomes a familiar um, literal sign across the, the city um, to remind people to protect pollinators. And then finally, um, over the past year, everything has changed for everyone. And of course, um, for the sustainable neighborhoods too. And our neighborhood volunteers have been um, very nimble in finding new ways to um, bring people together, even when they couldn't be physically together and finding ways to engage people in so many different new ways. Um, so that's been exciting to see. And I think, you know, that's one of the silver linings of 
the, the pandemic is finding these new ways to engage with people who we haven't seen before at some of the events. So I'm gonna hand it back to Alyssa to get into more about um, some of the basics and big picture of the program. Thanks. Great, thanks, Christy. Um, so I'm gonna take a moment now. I, I like to, we like to start this presentation off just with giving you some really good examples of what's happening on the ground. And then I'll step back and explain a little bit about the basics of how the program works. And then for those of you that are here as staff members or interested in um, learning what it takes to bring this to your community, we'll talk about kind of the infrastructure um, and the community needs to successfully adopt and implement this program. Uh, so Christy just, again, gave great examples of the work residents are doing in their neighborhoods. And before they can actually start that work, uh, neighborhoods have to actually apply to join the program. And so this could be, um, you know, it's a, it's a semi-rigorous application process. Uh, town staff, town and city staff is available um, throughout the application process to answer questions. And there's, um, you know, a, a variety of questions about, you know, just the general makeup of your community. What is community engagement? currently like in your neighborhood. Um, there are some questions about diversity and equity. And if you're accepted into the program, you know, how will you be in, um, engaging diverse uh, populations in the programming and the work that you're doing? And so once a neighborhood applies and is accepted, they go through a launch process in the community. And then once they're through that process, they begin hosting workshops, creating resources, um, and completing projects that advance neighborhood level sustainability. Um, and then as neighborhoods complete this work, they earn credits for their accomplishments. As, as Christy mentioned, it is a certification program. So um, city or town staff provide support to neighborhoods in the way of technical assistance and project planning, but staff is not actually doing the work. That's um, the volunteers and the residents on the ground are getting this done and then actually earning credits and certifying their neighborhoods in this program. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about certification uh, process in a second, but in order to be eligible for credits, neighborhood activities and projects have to fall under one of five goal areas. And these are energy, air, water, land, and people. And these goals, um, goal areas are, were intentionally kept pretty broad. Um, and oftentimes activities fall under multiple categories. And Christy mentioned kind of social sustainability. We see a lot of initiatives just focused on building community co cohesion and getting to know your neighbors um, and strengthening the community. And yes, um, Jillian, the city would have to become a member of a network before an individual neighborhood can actually apply to participate in the program. That is a good question. Um, so as far as the activities that are eligible for credits in the program, um, Christy kind of gave examples of a lot of these, but there are five eligible, um, five credit eligible activities. And when a neighborhood first joins the program, the, one of the first ways that they earn credits is by creating a comprehensive neighborhood outreach plan. And so city staff help, city or town staff help the neighborhood put this together. And um, it's, you know, we'll look at all of the different outreach channels that exist in a neighborhood and then help the community community to improve or create new outreach channels as well. Um, and this process also includes a discussion on how to engage diverse populations in the neighborhood and um, what tools or techniques are needed to do so. And then the neighborhood workshops, as Christy alluded to, are really focused on education and getting in the community and educating residents. Special events are those one or multiple day um, big events like the paint recycling that are um, a big action is happening. Clubs can be, you know, continuous um, meetings that happen throughout the year around specific topics or activities. And then the implementations are those big projects that are happening like the school recycling that you saw or the tree planting. And then each year, uh, as I mentioned, it's an annual certification program. So each year neighborhoods must earn enough credits to certify as either a participating or an outstanding sustainable neighborhood. Um, and in several of our member cities, when neighborhoods uh, certify as outstanding for the first time, they're recognized for their efforts by actually getting um, signs installed in their neighborhoods, like the one that you can see in this photo that have their neighborhood logo on it. And then each year that they recertify, they get the, the year added. Um, so that's one thing that some of our 
member cities do, others go to city council and present about the work that the volunteers are doing in their community. So there's a lot of different opportunities and ways to recognize um, the work that the residents are doing. Um, so there's definitely a lot of friendly competition, I would say, among neighborhoods within cities um, to, you know, like get the most credits and things. And the credits can definitely help incentivize um, to get more programs or projects being done on the ground. But ultimately, the residents that are participating in this program are doing it because they're passionate about making their neighborhoods cleaner, more equitable, stronger, uh, more sustainable for generations to come. So the credits are just kind of an extra way to keep track and to make sure that um, neighborhoods are getting the support that they need from the city. And then other benefits to participating in the program as a resident can um, range from leadership development. I like to use the example in Lakewood, uh, one city council member actually started her journey um, in Christie's neighborhood by applying for the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. And then that kind of action and in getting involved um, led her to run for city council. Um, and then other benefits include things like neighborhood pride and strengthening community cohesion. And then the pretty clear one of, you know, ecological enhancement and, and cleaner neighborhoods. So I'll briefly talk about um, the program infrastructure because I want to have, I want Kayla to have enough time to share a bit about what's happening in Wheat Ridge. Um, and I'm happy to all go through all of this kind of high level and then I'm our contact information will be on a slide and I'm happy to meet with people one-on-one -on -one to answer questions um, and talk about kind of next steps if you're interested in learning more. So the, um, the network board recently approved a new licensing fee structure and it's based on community population. So you may have noticed that I've been using the word city and town and community um, county throughout this presentation. So our current members are all cities and counties, but we're, we welcome inquiries and potential memberships from towns, cities, counties, or other local um, government agencies. Um, and this is a lot of words on this slide, but I just wanna highlight some of the um, benefits of becoming a member of the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. So the main one is um, as a member, you receive an entire framework um, for a program that has a proven, you know, successful track record for engaging neighborhoods in climate action and sustainability work. And the framework includes all the necessary templates, logos, marketing materials, um, the meeting and event schedule you would need for launching your neighborhoods, the neighborhood application itself that you could um, tailor to your community and, and dozens of other resources. Um, and it's important to note that all of these resources can be customized for your community. So we'll provide the general template and what they, it should look like, and then you can really tailor it to your um, climate goals and things like that. Sorry, I'm struggling with the slides here. Okay, um, and then program success in your community is really dependent on support across the whole organization, because many times um, your neighborhoods will need to collaborate not just with sustainability staff, but with different departments on projects that could be the parks department or the IT department. Um, so the network can help you navigate these discussions at the beginning when you're you know, trying to get management and things on board. Um, and we'd always be happy to meet with whoever else we need to in your community to talk about the program. And then the operating budget for our program for the program really differs across all of the member communities. And we've had members that do it for less than 10,000 a year in the past. Um, it's just important to note that the operating budget is not to pay for the projects. You're not using this to pay for a community garden, but you're using it to pay for um, the meetings that need to be organized and the, the other necessary resources um, for the process for getting a community garden installed. So that's just one example um, of where kind of the funding for this program is going. And then as a member, you get, um, each city has their own landing page on our website. And then um, under each city's landing page, each neighborhood also gets a page. And the website is um, a really great tool, tool for project tracking. So there's proposal and credit forms that are used to 
um, track certification and make sure that neighborhoods are on track. Um, and then it's the responsibility of individual community staff to manage all of the web pages. And then I just lastly want to mention that members that have implemented um, the program have various staffing models that work. So Lakewood and Denver both have employees that are dedicated to implementing the program with the support of interns. Um, and then in Fort Collins, there's been kind of the staff liaison model where individual staff members work with specific neighborhoods, but there's no one centralized coordinator of the program. Um, the important thing when it comes to staffing the program is consistency for the participating residents. So it's important um, when creating kind of trust and building positive working relationship with the residents in the communities that the staff member they're working with remains consistent. So no one member city um, is implementing this program in the same way when it comes to staffing budget. It's really customized to what resources you have available um, to get this up and running in your, in your city. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kayla now who will talk um, about how Wheat Ridge has implemented the program and some of their recent successes as our newest member of the network. And Kayla is the sustainability coordinator for the city of Wheat Ridge, coordinating the city's environmental sustainability programs for residents and businesses. She's the staff liaison to Sustainable Wheat Ridge, which is a volunteer resident advisory committee and works with the committee to develop and implement projects that support sustainability goals outlined in the city's sustainability climate action plan. Kayla manages the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program in Wheat Ridge. And as I mentioned, she sits on the board of directors for the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. Thanks, Alyssa. Good morning, everyone. And, and thank you also to Dr. Cog for having me on this panel today. Uh, like Alyssa mentioned, I manage the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program in Wheat Ridge, and we are the newest city to join the network. Uh, and in, that was in 2020. So my position is the first staff position within the city dedicated to sustainability. The position is relatively new with me coming on board with the city in, in February of 2020. So before there was a staff person, <clears throat> there was a long history of grassroots sustainability and community engagement in Wheat Ridge. And we are a unique example of how residents were able to provide input to city leaders to create and expand sustainability programming in the city of Wheat Ridge, including the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. Sus uh, sustainability got its official start in Wheat Ridge in 2017 when the then mayor appointed an 11 person environmental sustainability committee, now Sustainable Wheat Ridge, <clears throat> tasked with <clears throat> providing recommendations to council in six topic areas. So green business, uh, green, uh, green building and energy efficiency, renewable energy, transportation, solid waste and recycling, water and communication and engagement. And if you can remember the five topic areas of sustainable neighborhoods, our topic areas in our action plan line up really, really well with the five topic areas of sustainable neighborhoods. So the committee drafted this action plan and it was approved uh, by council in 2018. And so the sustainable neighborhoods program was highlighted in the communications and engagement section of the action plan as a way to build community and strengthen uh, neighborhood identity. There were also goals in our plan that referenced resident participation and recognition for sustainable practices and, and participation in, in sustainability programs. So the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program was a great next step for the committee and a great program for, for them to advocate for, as it also uh, kind of touches every, every topic of our sustainability action plan. So funding for the first year of the program, including budget for two neighborhoods and my position, a 0.5 FTE coordinator was approved for our 2020 budget year. When I was onboarded with the city in February of 2020, the pandemic hit shortly after and everything went to virtual in just a few weeks. So the network was able to virtually onboard me as the program coordinator for the new Sustainable Neighborhoods Program in Wheat Ridge. Um, although I was the first city representative to be onboarded virtually, I don't think that it hindered my progress a bit. We set up Zoom calls to talk through the program documents that I would have to edit. We talked through the credit system and the back end of the website and kind of how to construct the application and how to transition a typically in-person open house into a virtual event. 
Um, <clears throat> I uh, All the materials that the network created for us were really thorough and detail oriented. And so I was able to reach out, uh, use those materials and then reach out with any questions that I had. And it also felt great to be part of a program with a network of cities. So I was able to meet the other program coordinators from the other uh, network cities, and I was able to rely on them, ask questions, and you know this was really helpful when I was learning about the program and designing the program in Wheat Ridge. I also was able to check out the other cities' uh, website pages and see what other neighborhoods in other network cities were doing. So I had this information to kind of suggest programs um, and projects for our neighborhoods as they were looking to apply. So I rolled out the program in the spring of 2020 and the application period was from June to August with a virtual open house in July. Even though we were in the midst of a pandemic, we had two fantastic neighborhood applications um, and I onboarded the two neighborhoods in fall of 2020. <clears throat> So our first two neighborhoods in the program are Applewood Villages, uh, comprised of about 1,100 residents, and Paramount Heights, comprised of about 650 residents. The neighborhood leaders were really excited to get uh, to be accepted into the program and get started um, forming their project ideas. So first, we created a neighborhood leadership team in each of the neighborhoods. And the first few months of the program were really all about setting the neighborhoods up for success. So we developed email accounts and social media pages. We developed the neighborhood pages on the Sustainable Neighborhood website. And the neighborhoods created that outreach plan that Alyssa mentioned, which highlights different ways to get the word out about events and projects. The leadership teams then developed interest surveys, both online and mailed. Uh, to find out what types of projects their neighbors were interested in accomplishing. So the network provided me with all of, um, all of the templates and all of the tools that I needed for this onboarding uh, process. They provided me with an onboarding guide, and then we took those tools and those resources and templates and tailored them to work for you know, our unique neighborhoods. So after that, the leadership team used the information from the interest surveys to develop and lead some great projects in our city. Since the fall, we've hosted 33 events, workshops, and clubs in support of a variety of different sustainability topics, from composting workshops to leaf drop-off events to zero-waste food trucks to support local businesses during COVID. Neighborhoods have organized uh, seed sharing workshops, led a yoga in the park event to get the word out to more people about the program. And most recently, um, like Christy mentioned, we hosted a citywide paint recycling event with over 300 cars and over 36,000 pounds of paint diverted from the landfill just at the Prospect Park location in Wheat Ridge. This is the first event of its kind in Wheat Ridge. And so we feel very fortunate to be a part of the network and a, a part of uh, the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program to really uh, leverage these new resources that we have to, to provide this service to our community members. Our two neighborhoods are very close geographically, but very different um, as far as their demographics and their project interests. And the great thing about this program is that it's changing the way that our city works with the residents. So the neighbors are able to lead and manage these projects and I just provide them with the support they need to get it done. We've started also to address larger topics in our communities, such as income inequality and food insecurity, by focusing on the people category of the program and making an effort to build in donation drives and food drives into our sustainability events. We hosted an electronics and battery recycling event um, in conjunction with Sustainability, which is an organization that provides recycling and composting services and employment opportunities to those with intellectual or developmental disabilities. So that was a project that really brought together the three pillars of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. This event <clears throat> recycled over 26,000 pounds of electronic waste and over 200 pounds of batteries, as well as over $2,500 worth of donated kids' clothing, toys, and supplies, <clears throat> along with hats, gloves, and blankets for those experiencing homelessness in our community. So these are just some of the ways that we're utilizing the program to further our sustainability goals while also assisting our community members and making our community more resilient. 
As some of you uh, may know, waste services are a major issue in this region, with many cities in our area aiming to address this topic through policy changes or ballot initiatives aimed at consolidating waste providers within cities. Um, it is a contentious topic in some places, and so I wanted to highlight uh, a topic and a program that Sustainable Applewood Villages took on earlier this year. Like I mentioned before, when neighborhoods join the program, the leadership team drafts a mailer that goes out to all the residents within the neighborhood boundary with an interest survey. So out of the 468 homes within the Applewood Villages boundary, they had over a 20% response rate through their online and paper survey that was mailed. And 90% of those respondents said they were either interested or very interested in a preferred neighborhood trash hauler. The, the potential benefits included a reduction in the service rate, lower carbon emissions, less truck traffic, noise pollution, and sidewalk clutter throughout the week, as well as a reduction in hazards for children playing in the streets. So in addition, many people were excited to be represented by an organized resident-led program that could leverage improvement in the reliability of the services. So after they received this feedback from the first survey, the leadership team contacted multiple different service providers and obtained, obtained uh, competitive group rate pricing for the residents, which was on average 50% less than current individual rates. Uh, in February of this year, they sent out an additional survey to their residents to see what they really valued in their trash hauler, such as a local company, a reduced rate, or natural gas trucks, just as a few examples. The leadership team then took this information and compared it to the data that they had from the, the quotes from the companies, and they ended up choosing <clears throat> a local company, Summit Waste and Recycling, to service their neighborhood at a very competitive rate. They, uh, Summit is also showing their commitment to sustainability by offering three different bin sizes for trash services, along with a true pay-as-you-throw program in which residents purchase prepaid trash bags and only pay for their recycling services. Summit is offering the Sustainable Neighborhood residents free large item pickup and yard waste recycling events, and they're also providing complimentary carry back service and a cart cleaning program that uh, residents can opt into. Summit is building a composting option <clears throat> into their strategic plan, and they've set a two year goal for adding the service into their portfolio. So as you can see on this slide, uh, the neighborhood also secured Sustainable Neighborhoods branded trash carts and recycling carts as a way to advertise the Sustainable Neighborhood Program. And now the leadership team from Applewood Villages is meeting with other interested neighborhood groups in both Wheat Ridge and Lakewood that are interested in expanding this type of programming. So the major benefit here is that these groups now don't need to recreate the wheel and they can work with the other sustainable neighborhoods to learn, you know, how, how they developed their surveys, how they collected this data and analyzed it. And so they're able to move forward quickly with um, their own neighborhood contracts. This story is a fantastic example of the innovative ways the sustainable neighborhood program and neighborhood leaders are solving large scale issues on a neighborhood level, taking problems and solutions into their own hands, giving a voice to their neighbors and implementing projects that can provide a pilot study for cities and a potential framework for larger scale implementation of these types of programs in the future. <clears throat> So just as a last word here, um, this program is really beneficial to our city at, in Wheat Ridge as it creates a framework for our residents to develop an action plan that enhances the long-term character, livability, and sustainability of individual and unique neighborhoods, leading to an overall increase in neighborhood connections and resiliency in our city. It also serves as a tool for engagement um, in other city-led programs. So the entire, for the last year, I've been working with our uh, neighborhood department and one of our senior neighborhood planners to align on communication and outreach strategies so that, you know, both of our programs can be as successful as possible. And I know we've mentioned this multiple times during our presentation, but this program is resident led, which really differentiates it from other city programs. And so when we implement a program with this framework, we're allowing our residents to lead one another, not only within the sustainable neighborhood program, but in making positive change within our city. Uh, the structure of this program inherently creates a framework for individuals to become engaged and active within our city government, local organizations, 
businesses and with other residents, which can result in a, in a network of leaders in our community. And on behalf of the sustain the board of directors of the sustainable neighborhood network, we want to thank you so much for attending this webinar today. Um, if you have any questions for us, you can uh, stay on and ask us questions in the in the Q and A chat, or feel free to uh, email us at the the email address listed, or visit our website to learn more about the different cities and the different neighborhoods that are participating in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, and thank you to um, all of our speakers today. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to turn their webcams on. Um, now we have reached the Q&A portion of our session today. Um, so I'll just put these instructions on the screen, look for that icon with the um, Q&A, and you can um, drop your questions in that chat box. I see we have some coming in. But while you're doing that, um, I Just wanted to um, do a couple more introductions. Um, we are joined um, by Jonathan. Um, Jonathan is the sustainability manager for the city of Lakewood. Um, since joining the city, he has been the project manager for numerous comprehensive plan amendments, created Lakewood's award-winning sustainable neighborhoods program that we're talking about today, and co-founded the employees committee for a sustainable Lakewood. Um, thank you so much for being here, Jonathan. Um, I also wanted to um, hand off the reins to Andy Taylor. Um, he's the manager of um, regional planning at Dr. Cog, um, and he's gonna be moderating the discussion today. Um, so take it away, Andy. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate, and thank you all for the presentations. We've been getting um, some questions throughout the presentations, and we even got a couple uh, during registration. So I please feel free to keep, uh, I'll be monitoring these uh, along with Kate um, and, and turning them over to the panel. But I wanted to start with one that came in during registration. Is this program available outside Colorado? You may have touched on some of this, but I just wanted to ask this question to make it clear. Yeah, um, that's a good question. We have not yet expanded outside of Colorado, but the potential to do so does exist. And I think um, speaking to what Kayla mentioned about the virtual the virtual training and the virtual onboarding, we now actually have the skill set with our, among our board and our staff to actually do that. So so yes, if you're outside of Colorado, still connect with us and we'd love to talk more. And then another question we got ahead of time um, that I know uh, I think Kayla touched on was how do we deliver access to food as part of a sustainable neighborhood? Does one of, our, one of our coordinators want to speak to that? Are there any uh, good examples of, um, of programs? I know the food drives, mm -hmm. um, what one mentioned, but um, are there any good examples out there you'd like to highlight? Yeah, go ahead, Christy. I know that you all are doing a lot of great work with the community gardens in Lakewood and, and the food related programs. Yes, yes, our, several of our, <clears throat> excuse me, several of our community gardens have started food donation programs where specific plots within the community garden are designated specifically as donation plots, as well as um, uh, scheduling a, a designated day when um, people can leave things in a box or a cooler and then volunteers deliver those to food banks, um, either within the neighborhood or a, a larger scale uh, food bank within the city. Um, so that's one, one example. Um, in addition to setting up volunteer days at food banks or food rescue programs. Um, so again, as all programs, it would need to be an initiative from volunteers within the neighborhood to say, okay, this is a topic that we um, want to address with our neighborhood. So that's the way it would start is that neighbors within a neighborhood would say, okay, this is a topic we want to address. And then they would find their ways to connect with um, either services or um, individuals um, within their neighborhoods or within the communities. 
right. And I think it's really great too. Uh, I think sustainable neighborhood residents, they just really want to be promoting other sustainability programs as well. So we partnered uh, with Fresh Food Connect, which is an app where farmers and residents can donate unused produce to people um, through a nonprofit called Family Tree to people experiencing homelessness and food insecurity in our community. And so both of our sustainable neighborhoods are really excited to promote that program to their, their, you know, their boundary of residents this summer too. So I think it's really great how they just want to support this uh, portfolio of sustainability programming. Uh, we've got another question on the trash haulers uh, that, that Kayla mentioned. Did you experience any pushback in consolidating trash haulers? I know this has been a hot topic throughout Colorado uh, as communities seek to, to consolidate. Yeah, that's why I wanted to highlight it as a sustainable neighborhood initiative, because we've seen other cities kind of try a variety of different topics from policy changes to kind of consolidate um, uh, different you know, regulations around trash hauling, but kind of allowing the sustainable neighborhood group to take the reins on this project um, allowed, you know, it to kind of be a grassroots effort. And so coming from the ground up, uh, Summit Waste kind of was interacting with them as, the, as if they were an HOA group. And so it really made a, a great difference, I think, to have it come from the residents instead of it coming, you know, from the city government. No, that's, that's great insight. That's a big value for a lot of communities, I think. Um, another question here, if I live in an unincorporated community in my county, would I need the county to be a part of the network? That, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I, I, I'm not sure. I think, you know, mostly, you know, at this point, all the members are cities. So the question is, what is the, um, you know, who's running the program? Is there a, a entity that can, you know, create consistency and provide the guidance and kind of the glue that holds the, the program together for a neighborhood? And so if, you know, there's a special district or, you know, an HOA maybe, but I think, you know, um, we probably, it would depend on circumstances. I think we, are, we have explored some counties uh, you know, launching the program with some counties, and that definitely could work. Um, so I guess that's a, a lot of depends. Yeah, uh, maybe a related question here is, um, are there any recommended parameters around how a neighborhood is defined around for size or um, how, how you get going with that? Um, that is decided upon um, in the application when the neighborhoods actually apply their able to define what they think the boundaries for their neighborhood should be. And then um, when reviewing the application, city staff um, can provide input. And if the neighborhood's accepted mm -hmm. into the program, they can suggest boundary um, changes. If, you know, we want to, we want people to identify with the neighborhood. So if they've created a brand new name that no one's ever heard of, and people are going to be like, what is sustainable, you know, whatever it happens to be and, and no one relates to it, then staff might recommend that you use something um, that everyone is kind of familiar and identifies with. Is that, Kayla and Christy, do you have anything to add to that? And we do have, we have some members that have, um, like Denver has registered neighborhood organizations covering all of Denver. So anywhere you're at in Denver, you're within a registered neighborhood organization, whereas in um, Lakewood and I believe in Wheat Ridge, you, there are certain neighborhoods that have registered as, as neighborhood organizations, but not all of the city is actually covered by, by neighborhoods. So um, that's where kind of the flexibility in determining the name and the boundaries come. And then we've also had neighborhoods like in Lakewood that have started the program, participated for a few years and said, we need to grow, we need to maybe expand our boundaries to include um, neighborhoods across neighbors across this street or across this park. Okay. I'll also just chime in that I don't think any of our neighborhoods um, put up fences when it comes to participation. So, um, you know, it's a it's more of a brand, you know, an identification as Alyssa mentioned of where you live, and um, I, I can think of at least a handful of like really strong leaders in Lakewood neighborhoods that might actually live outside the boundaries of what's been drawn on a map as the sustainable neighborhoods, but they are still very active because that there's that platform and that 
you know group of people working on on these things so uh, it's a inclusive process you know uh, program excellent uh i've got another question that that all of you might be able to speak to what was the most difficult thing starting the program within your city i can go first on this one well we i started the program in the middle of a pandemic and so it was a unique situation for for me but i think even if it hadn't been that circumstance i probably probably a new city would have had similar uh, struggles and challenges but for me it was really uh just getting the word out about a brand new program in the city and so really being creative about the different marketing opportunities that we had both virtually online through social media platforms website things like that and then also um i think what really helped and this year kind of we have the op we're opening the application in a few weeks so we're kind of doing our second round and we're doubling our neighborhoods in wheat ridge so now i'm kind of doing it all over again and something that's helped me this time around is finding um really passionate people around the city and um you know we have some yard signs that people have put out we are doing pop-up events things like that so just really thinking creatively about how to get the word out about the program when when it's first starting Jonathan, do you want to speak to that at all from? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it'd be probably a better question to if we had uh, folks from Fort Collins and Denver here. I think, you know, in Lakewood, we started it as a pilot program and it was just kind of testing the waters on how you could really crowdsource sustainability implementation. So um, at that point in time, I think it was mostly just the challenge was just getting other departments on board. Um, to make sure that they would help support the ideas that were coming out of the neighborhood and helping them see that rather than viewing this as a risk. And, and I think this is one of the things that's really amazing about this program and was not necessarily intended, but um, has clearly emerged over the years that we've had this in place is that starting this program is not a risk. If you have a few bucks, you can, and it's not a lot of dollars to put at it. There's no risk here. That there's actually a release valve of risk for your organization because these neighborhoods are generating the projects and the programs and you're supporting them. And if they don't work out, it's okay, except for maybe some people that put in some effort that might be disappointed, but there's really low risk to the organization. Um, it's an adaptive operating system, really. I mean, it's a place to test things with political safety, with, you know, organizational safety. It's not, you know, um, any, and then, and then when something works, it can be replicated and adopted and help solve problems for a city. And I think, um, that's really the, you know, the bread and butter is, is this kind of like testing ground to try things out and find creative solutions. And back to the, even the question about, um, you know, food access and, you know, and, and who, how you advance maybe the goals of your comprehensive plan or your sustainability plan is that this helps you create an ecosystem within your community, within neighborhoods where you have active and passionate people that can share their expertise and resources where you can leverage existing city programs with people who might be interested in trying things out. So even if you're not telling them to do a project, you can shop opportunities, whether it's coming from grants or partner organizations to neighborhoods and say, hey, we're, is your neighborhood interested in trying this project? Um, your nonprofits in the area tap into these neighborhoods because they know there's people that might be interested in helping their programs and that they might find volunteers. The business community loves having active, um, positive relationships with neighbors that want to, you know, help leverage their services or expertise. So like back to the Be Safe program, part of that program is pledging, <clears throat> helping neighbors pledge to not use pesticides, but also part of it was workshops and connecting them with businesses and working with local grow houses to like get the right types of pollinator friendly plants, learn how to take care of your yard without pesticides. So you're just creating this ecosystem that really can almost we found can be applied to almost any initiative or projects, project um, or goal your city has in some way. So. All right, well, we're running up against time. Um, we might have time for one uh, quick question here. Um, have any neighborhoods pursued a project that created individual benefits? Um, uh, the example is household rain barrels. Did that create any conflicts, especially if public money was used to support the project? Uh, 
I think there's always a question of like, are you giving special treatment to a certain part of your city? And is it fair to use those resources? And I think um, as Alyssa maybe mentioned, most of the dollars for this program are going to help with communication and um, <clears throat> supplies. And so in an example of any initiative that I can think of where there's been a push to help people, you know, xeriscape their yards or do rain barrels or put solar panels on their homes or anything like that. Really, the program is supporting the educational opportunity and the information on how to do it. And if the neighborhood as a group wants to reach out to the local hardware store and negotiate some kind of discount on supplies or, you know, try to collectively negotiate better rates, they can do that. But there's no city money really going to that. So we haven't had a problem with that. Well, we're right at time. I, I really want to thank you all again. Um, and please feel free. Uh, it sounds like uh, the network is very interested in more questions um, if you want to follow up with them directly. So um, uh, there's the contact info again. Uh, we just really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you for, for coming. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Please reach out. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thanks to all the attendees. Um, please remember to take a moment to respond to the survey that will pop up um, after you um, close out the webinar screen. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.